Hey there, it's Pastor Joel, and I am so glad that you could join us virtually for worship this morning. It is our prayer that by making our services available on Facebook and YouTube, that we might be able to bless you by, by getting the word to you, right? Because faith comes by what is heard. That said, what you're about to engage in over the course of the next hour is in no way intended to serve as a replacement for actually being involved with a local church. Because that is so important in the life of a believer. Your local church is the visible presence of Christ's body on earth. With all of her warts, with all of her scars, Christ died and then rose from the dead for sinners that fill those churches. Sinners like, your, like yourself. Christ died and rose from the dead for sinners like yourself and people that fill those churches. So I hope that if you're not plugged into one, that you would engage and, and find one and engage and plug into it. So this hour could be treated maybe as a vitamin to that or a supplement to that, something you listen to while working out or jogging or driving to work in your car or maybe even you know washing dishes at the end of a long day, uh, but, but not as for being in a local church. That said, you're, you're more than welcome to join us here at Turkey Branch. We would love to have you. At the end of this video, I'll put our church's information so you can see how to contact us and where to find us. We meet on Sundays at 11 o'clock, but there are a lot of good Bible-believing, Bible-proclaiming churches out there. Uh, but you are more than welcome. We invite you to join us with us in person. Um, that all said, church is about to begin. And for the next hour, I hope that you will be encouraged and blessed by the gospel proclaimed. Last week, we saw how John was struggling with doubt due to his unmet expectations limited perception, and difficult circumstances. The Messiah wasn't shaping up to be who he thought he would be or do what he thought he would do. Israel was still plagued with sin and political corruption. He couldn't see what God was doing with this. He, truthfully, he wasn't thinking big enough. And ever since Jesus came onto the scene, John has been locked up in prison. So he asked, he sent two of his, his disciples to go to Jesus and ask, are you for sure the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? So John is, is doubting, but remember, as we brought out last week, doubt is not the same as outright unbelief. Doubt is not the same as outright unbelief. As Alistair McGrath said it, unbelief is the decision to live your life as if there is no God. It is a deliberate decision to reject Jesus Christ and all that he stands for. But doubt is something quite different. Doubt arises within the context of faith. That is a wistful longing to be sure of the things in which we trust. As I shared last week, this is like the, the father of the demoniac boy going up to Jesus and saying, I believe, help my unbelief. He's really saying, I believe, help my doubt. How does Jesus respond? He tells them to do two things. First, read your Bible. He tells him to read his Bible. Jesus takes him to Isaiah 35 and 61 and reminds him of the Messianic prophecies. Jesus is essentially saying, read your Bible, John, and, and, and you'll see. Second, Jesus then, then tells him to joyfully submit himself to this biblical revelation. Blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. That's in verse 6. That's the same word used to describe the Nazarenes in Mark 6 when they didn't believe that Jesus could be the Messiah because he was just the, quote, the carpenter, the son of Mary. So they didn't believe they were, quote, offended by him. Same word there. Jesus is giving John a mild rebuke and saying, John, be careful that you don't let your improper expectations cause you to question me. Read your Bible and joyfully submit yourself to that biblical revelation. Tell your moods where to get off and trust to be true what you doubt based on what you know to be true. So we may wonder, based on this exchange of Jesus' rebuke and John's doubting and questioning, if, if tension was building between the two of them, between Jesus and John the Baptist. However, the text goes on today to make clear that there is no animosity between them. 
In fact, Jesus is about to give John some very high praise. As John's two disciples leave Jesus and the crowds to make their way back to Machirus, which is the, the fortress east of the Dead Sea where John is being held, carrying with them Jesus' message to help him stand firm in the faith, Jesus turns to the crowds in order to defend John. It's almost as if some of them were standing close enough to hear the disciples' questions and Jesus' rebuke. And, and so John, Jesus feels the need to exonerate him, to exonerate John. So he turns this into a teachable moment for the crowd. Let's stand and pray, and then we'll read together from Matthew 11. Let's pray. Divine Spirit, illumine us to the words of the Lord. Show us the wealth of glory that lies beneath the old familiar stories. Teach us the depths of meaning hidden in the songs of Zion. Raise us to the heights of aspiration that is reached by the wings of the prophet. Lift us to the summit of faith that is trod by the feet of the apostle. Open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of your word. Amen. Matthew 11, Matthew 11, 7 to 11. Matthew 11, 7 to 11. Hear the word of our Lord. As these men were leaving, Jesus begins to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? See, those who wear soft clothes are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. Truly, I tell you, among those born of woman, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. It's the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. I want us to focus this morning on verse 11 in particular. Because Jesus makes two shocking claims there. First, that John the Baptist is the greatest man ever born to woman. Right? That, is a, that is a shocking claim made by the Son of God. And second, he goes on to say that even the least in the kingdom is still greater than he. That's another shocking claim. He says that first John the Baptist is the greatest man ever born to woman, and then he says that the least in the kingdom is still greater than he. And we're going to take those two shocking claims in that order. Consider the first one then. This is quite a statement in and of itself. Now think about all the, the spiritual giants who have come before John that we read about in the Old Testament. They would have been included in this broad, sweeping claim that John was better than them. We're talking guys like Abraham, Moses, Elijah, and King David, a man described as after God's own heart. Jesus says that none of them, as great as they were, were greater than John. R.C. Sproul once claimed that John the Baptist is the most underrated person in the New Testament. And I would argue, based on Jesus' claim here, he's the most underestimated person in the entire Bible. Now, what are we to make of this shocking claim about John? For starters, claims about Je Jesus' claims about John weren't so much about him as a person as they were about his place in redemptive history. His role. Now, how do I know this? We'll look at the context of the passage. Before Jesus makes this big statement, he first describes John's role as a prophet. Y'all, what does a prophet do? What does a prophet do? Throughout the Old Testament, a prophet functioned as a spokesman for God, crying out to God's people for them to repent and turn to the Lord. That's what they do. They cry out to God's people for them to repent and return to the Lord. Often they would warn of impending judgment to those who won't repent while promising forgiveness and mercy to those who do repent, to the repentant. Interlaced with their cries for repentance was always a messianic hope. In other words, their grounding for repentance and forgiveness was based on the fact that God would one day send a Messiah who would purify Israel and establish them as an everlasting kingdom that he would rule from the throne of David. They would be eternally secure in him, in this coming Messiah, in this coming kingdom. 
This is what Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and all the prophets foretold. This was their reasoning for why God's people needed to repent and return. It was grounded in messianic hope. However, John, unlike the rest of the Old Testament prophets who went before him, would be the prophet tasked with announcing his arrival. Right? That's exciting. Unlike the rest of the prophets, John didn't say he's coming. Instead, John said he's here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. He would be the one crying out, the voice of one crying out for Isaiah 43, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness. Make straight highway for God in our desert, in the, in the desert. Malachi 4, 5 to 6 described the last prophet's work like this. Look, I am going to send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. And John clarifi Jesus clarifies of John in Matthew eleven fourteen, 14, and if you're willing to accept it, he, John, is the Elijah who is to come. Many prophets had come before him. Ezekiel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, and a host of others. But none of these holy men of God had the distinct privilege of announcing the arrival of the king. John's ministry was the prophetic climax of all pre-Christian revelation. Not only was he, like the other prophets before him, a direct spokesman for God to call Israel to repentance, but he himself was also the subject of prophecy, the one who, according to Scripture, would announce the day of Yahweh. In fact, Jesus, in fact, Jesus explicitly in our passage this morning references Malachi 3 in his little speech to the crowd today. If we back up to verse 10, we read this. We read this in verse 10. He's referencing Malachi 3.1. This is about the one whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. This quote from Malachi is a direct prophecy of John. So in other words, he is saying John is the prophecy prophet. He is a prophet who is also the subject of prophecy. What makes him so great, though, is the simple fact that he, more than the others before him, points to Christ. That's what makes John so great. He, more than the others who went before him, more clearly points to Christ. Y'all, it's not that he's more sinless than David, or, or even that he had fewer doubts than Abraham. As we saw last week, he definitely did not. It's simply because he, more clearly than the others before him, points us to Christ. Y'all, let's be honest. Right, The best man born to woman, he, right, which John was, is still just a man at best. Right, The best man born to woman is still just a man at best. This means that John struggled with all the temptations common to humanity. And unlike Jesus, he did not triumph over them. He was still a fallen man. He was still only saved by God's grace. John did not wake up one morning and be like, you know, I'm going to be the, I'm going to be the one that Malachi said would prepare the way for Jesus. Someone has got to do it. May as well be me. Right? Then, then put on a camel hair garment and adopt a locust eating only diet. John didn't wake up one morning with the urge to just do that, right? He was chosen for that purpose from long before he was born, right? He was conceived for that purpose while John is in his mother Elizabeth's womb. She goes to see her cousin Mary, who is also pregnant. Y'all know who with? Jesus, right? Luke 141 says that when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby inside her leapt. So that is, little peanut John the Baptist leapt inside her womb, right? And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. John didn't just wake up one day when he turned 21 and go and be like, yeah, you know, I think I'm going to be this guy. I'm going to give this a try. No, God had chosen him for this work from before the foundations of the world. And, and apart from that, apart from God's gracious choosing of John, he was just a man. He wasn't the eternal Logos incarnate, the Word made flesh, as Jesus was. He was just a man. And though he was the greatest man ever born to woman due to the calling God placed on his life, he was still just a man, subject to temptations. And as we saw last week, even doubts, even doubts. If it wasn't for God's gracious choosing of John, John would have been just another of Adam's seed in bondage to his fallen nature, destined for hellfire. 
But God had great plans for John. Listen, church, what I'm trying to get across about verse 11 is this. What made John so great wasn't John's greatness. Did you catch that? What made John so great wasn't John's greatness. It was the greatness of God's plans for him. That's important to get. It was given to him to be the one with the privilege of proclaiming, prepare the way of the Lord in the wilderness, make a straight highway for our God in the desert, and to proclaim the kingdom of God is at hand. John, unlike all the prophets before him, he could proclaim, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John proclaimed that first. That's what makes John so great. His proclamation of Christ. Understanding this, we are better able to understand what Jesus says next. Because Jesus then makes a second shocking statement in the second half of verse 11. After this, he says, considering how great John is, but, but, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. That's another heavy statement. (laughs) We're wading through some heavy statements this morning. The key to unraveling the meaning of this, albeit seemingly odd statement, after all, we just spent 10 minutes defending what made John so great, now he says is even the least is greater than he. The key to unraveling this lies in remembering what Jesus meant by the word great. What is, what's in that word great? Now listen, y'all know me. I've said it before and I'm sure I'll say it again. But in theology, words matter, right? The old saying, y'all know it sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, is true. But words can sure conjure up a flurry of heresy, Right? Words and definitions matter in good Bible reading and when driving theology and practice from that. So that said, what does Jesus mean by the word great? What is in the word great? Well, in Western culture today, we use the word great like this. We we use the word in a very superficial manner. Y'all know Muhammad Ali, the former heavyweight boxing champion, used to claim that he was the greatest, by which he meant he was the most accomplished in the field. Now, when I talk about Ford trucks, I say they're great, right? And the artist got Brother Ellis' old 86 all shined up this week, and she's got another 300,000 miles in her, right? They're great. They're Ford tough. They run forever. However, in biblical language, great has a much different meaning. To be great is not simply to excel in one area or another or to be better than something else. Right? To be great is to be in a position of extraordinary blessedness. You tracking with that? In biblical language, to be great is not simply to excel in one area or another. Rather, it is to be in a position of extraordinary blessedness. That's what it means to be great in the Bible. Great capacity for blessedness. Look, when Noah pronounced his patriarchal blessing on his three sons, he blessed Shem and cursed Canaan. Y'all remember that? Genesis 9, Canaan's the son of Noah's son, Ham. But what about Noah's other son, Japheth? Noah prayed that he would be, quote, enlarged in Genesis 9, 25 to 27. Noah said, Canaan is cursed. He will be the lowest of slaves to his brothers. He also said, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. Let God extend Japheth, that is literally, let Japheth be enlarged. Let Japheth dwell in the tents of Shem. Let Canaan be Shem's slave. Noah was not asking that Japheth himself would gain weight, right? He would be enlarged physically, or even that his family line would expand, right? I I need someone to pray that over me, the, the weight thing, the expand that way. But Noah was praying that Japheth would gain a greater capacity for blessedness. Noah was asking that Japheth would enlarge, that he would expand, that he would gain a greater capacity for blessedness and thus become great by being in a position of extraordinary blessedness, being blessed. Beloved, here's how that applies to our text today. Because God has ordained that we live in this particular age, right, 2022, this particular time, we have, you and I, have 
a greater capacity for blessedness than John ever had. The same is true for all who live on this side of the cross. In short, what made John greater than all who went before him makes us even greater yet. Look at where John fell in respect to all the prophets and to us. You know, it's true. Where do we read about John? We read about John in the New Testament, right? But you have to realize, John lived and ministered in an Old Testament context. Chronologically, he came before Jesus, right? He preceded the Christ. Barely, but he did. Thus, John did not live in the New Covenant as you and I do. Why? Well, the New Covenant didn't begin until Jesus inaugurated it in the upper room on the night when he was betrayed, and John was gone by then. Folks, Jesus is saying the least person born into the New Covenant is in a greater position of blessedness than even John the Baptist, the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. We sometimes think, y'all, don't we sometimes think how wonderful it would have been to have lived in the first century? and walked with these crowds, and seen Jesus? And I think, yes, that would have been wonderful. But beloved, let's be careful, because we are blessed beyond that so much right now. We're on a far better side of the cross than the people who lived then, because we're on this side of the cross. We're on this side of the resurrection. We're on this side of Pentecost. We're on this side of redemptive history. Listen, John would have loved, John would have loved to have had the full picture of Christ that you have today. John would have given anything to have the full picture of Christ that you have today. He was the greatest in the Old Covenant due to his role in him being so close, and yet, so close and yet so far, right? Like horseshoes and hand grenades. Yet, he was still on the wrong side of the cross of Calvary. He did not know then what we know now. John did not have the finished work of Christ to look back on because Christ was not finished yet. Praise be to God, he was still saved by the same grace that saves you and I. Right? He was still saved by the same grace. He was saved in the same way that Abraham and all the Old Testament saints were saved by believing in the promises and it being credited to him for righteousness. That's how you've always been saved. But where John had the promises of Christ, We have the finished work of Christ. John was saved in the future work, the promises, an incomplete picture. We're saved in the finished work, beloved. We have a complete picture. We have the completed canon, right? We've got the completed canon. We have a greater blessedness today than John ever dreamed of. Not to mention we have 2,000 years of church history. Guys like Charles Spurgeon, John Calvin, Martin Luther, Thomas Aquinas, and Augustine of Hippo, who have wrestled with the Scriptures and mined out deep, beautiful truths about the Trinity and the hypostatic union of Christ that John the Baptist only saw dimly through a foggy mirror that still had the packaging tape stuck on it, right? But we have had guys strip all that away, and we can see so much more clearly now. Thanks to the finished work of Christ, and 2,000 years of church history bearing testimony. Now, can we see the Trinity in the Old Testament? Can we see these things in the Old Testament? Could they see these things in the Old Testament? Sure, and yes, they did. They've always been there. But it helps that we now know what we're looking for. It's like playing a game of I Spy. Have you all ever played I Spy before? Right, surely most of us have. It's not that the, you look at a page for a long time looking for a little trinket or something, all of a sudden you see it. It's not that the objects on the page changed, right? It's not that it wasn't there and then it was. It's just that once the object has been revealed to you, someone comes along and goes, well, there's the spring. It's right there in the middle of the page, right? Now you go, well, duh, it was right there in front of my eyes the whole time. Once the object has been revealed to you, you see it so much clearly than you did the past two hours when you were looking for it, right? And then once you see it, you can't unsee it. That's kind of how biblical revelation is, right? In this way, John the Baptist had so much more revealed to him than the prophets who had gone before him, and due to his role in preparing the way for Christ, no one greater than he had yet been born to man because he saw far much more than they did. 
But once Jesus inaugurated the kingdom, he established the new covenant, and he ascended to be seated at the right hand of the Father on the throne of David, even the least of the saints now knows and sees so much more than John the Baptist ever did. It was always there, but we just see it so much fuller now. In this way, us living and existing post-Calvary, after the resurrection, after Pentecost, after the completed canon, our capacity for blessedness is so much greater than John's. Beloved, I want us to see this morning how infinitely blessed you are to be living in these times so that no one takes that for granted. D.A. Carson wrote in his book, God With Us, so often Christians want to establish their greatness with reference to their work, their giving, their intelligence, their preaching, their gifts, their, their courage, their discernment. But Jesus unhesitatingly affirmed that even the least believer is greater than Moses or John the Baptist simply because of his or her ability. Living on this side of the coming of Jesus the Messiah to point him out with greater clarity and understanding than all his forerunners ever could. If we really believe this truth, it will dissipate all cheap vying for position and force us to recognize that our true significance lies simply in our witness to the Lord Jesus Christ. Did y'all catch that? It's not my words, it's a quote. I'm going to restate part of that. Jesus unhesitatingly affirmed that even the least believer is greater than Moses or John the Baptist. Why? Simply because of his or her ability, living on this side of the coming of Jesus the Messiah, to point him out with greater clarity and understanding than all his forerunners ever could. Wow. Have you been longing for confidence in evangelism, brother or sister? Have, have you been looking for a confidence boost to share the gospel, brother or sister? There it is. <laughs> There's your confidence boost. All that Moses did, freeing hundreds of thousands of slaves from Egypt, and all that John the Baptist did, and yet you and I are in a far better position to proclaim Christ with far more clarity than any of the Old Testament prophets. That should give you a confidence boost. <laughs> Let me sum this up. I'm going to sum it up and restate it one more way to make sure you're getting this. Because this is the thrust of what Jesus is telling the crowds here today, and in effect us. So if you miss this, you're missing what Jesus is saying here. While John was the climax of all who had come before and pointed to Christ, none of them, not even the greatest of them, had the position and privilege that is reserved for all believers who would come after Christ. That's because all men, including John the Baptist, had an incomplete picture of the Messiah. Their perspective was limited in terms of what to expect from him. Thus, they often had unmet expectations whenever they ended up in difficult circumstances, and sometimes it would even lead to doubting, as it did in John the Baptist. However, even the least person who comes into the kingdom after Jesus has a greater understanding of the Messiah than everyone who came before him. Therefore, as followers of Christ today, we should be amazed and grateful that we have a greater privilege and position than John the Baptist did. Because while John was unclear on all that the Messiah would do, we know today what Christ has done. Let's say it one more time. While John was unclear on all that the Messiah would do, we know all that Christ has done. Church, we have the privilege of proclaiming the crucified and resurrected king to the ends of the earth. John went ahead to make way, but we have the unique confidence of following in his blessed footsteps. So we go forth in order to gather together what he has already purchased. The price is paid. He paid it in full. What a marvelous position in redemptive history you and I have. Right? This was Paul's confidence, right? Acts, was it 18, 8, 18, 10? God tells Paul, here's how you have confidence when you go into Corinth. For I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you. Why? Because I already have many people in the city. Just go take the gospel to them. I already have them. It's done. 
Therefore, let us take hold of this truth and be faithful to our task, a task that is greater than all the prophets of the Old Testament. So I ask you this morning, as we wrap up our second point, do you want to be something great in life? Simple. Here's how you can be great according to the Scriptures. Proclaim Christ. Proclaim Christ. How blessed are we that every believer is now made a priest and ambassador of the king, equipped through the work of the prophets, but with far greater confidence and clarity. 1 Peter 2, 4-10 says to the church in language formerly reserved for only the prophets, but is now to all of us, he says, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, so that you, why, may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We're all made priests and prophets to the king. Oh, how blessed we are that even the least in the kingdom today, even the least in this royal priesthood, this holy nation, this people for his possession, are greater than John the Baptist. And as far as the Old Testament saints go, he was the greatest, and yet even the least today is greater than he. No, not in the sense of being more holy or a better man of God, but greater in the sense of blessedness and privilege which is truly the best kind of greatness since it comes from God as an irrevocable gift. The Old Testament prophets often proclaimed truths that they did not fully understand, and yet we proclaim a truth which has been fully revealed. So here brings me to my third point. What does this say of the soft, measly proclaimers of the gospel today? Having all the things that we have, the privilege, the clarity, the canon, the finished work, What does it say of the soft, kind of squishy pastors today? Well, John, Jesus contrasted John with preachers like this, which is our third and final point. We're going to back up to verses 7 and 8. He asked the crowd, What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A a man dressed in soft clothes? See, those who wear soft clothes are in royal places. The word translated read there in verse 7 is calamon, calamon, which calamon is a type of cane grass found in abundance along the Jordan River. And if you've ever paid attention to cane grass or kind of reedy grasses that grows up in marshes and along rivers, well, what does it do? You ever watched it? Well, it grows up in clumps, right? It grows up in masses, and it just kind of sort of blows around together, Right? bowing in whatever direction the wind is blowing that day. Jesus is talking about a fickle person, tossed about in his judgment by the winds of public opinion or private misfortune. He is dressed in fine clothes, dressed to impress. He goes where the money is. He is only in this to climb a social ladder. He lives in royal palaces. He is what they call a professional preacher. Right, we all know one, a career man. He goes where the money is. They had them then too, y'all. <laughs> this isn't a uniquely American problem. They had them then too. Turn on your TV, and they didn't have TVs to see them on back then, but they had prophets for hire, though. When contrasted with John the Baptist, the man Jesus is describing here appears very soft. Because what did John look like? When you contrast this prophet for hire, this career preacher with John, right? what did John look like? How did John dress? What did John do? Well, go back to Matthew 3, 1 to 5. It describes John like this. In those days, John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. For he is the one spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, who said, A voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John had a camel hair garment with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Somebody bring that to the potluck tonight. The people, then people from Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the vicinity of the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. That's not exactly the image of a well-dressed man whose preaching is concerned about the winds of public opinion, is it? The numbers start getting slim and go, we better change it up. This isn't working. 
Right, listen, if the first century crowd should have known better right, about what they were going out to hear, and Jesus seems to assume they should have known better, how much more should we? If they were already without excuse and getting chastised for pursuing teaching that tickled their ears, then we of all people, beloved, should know better. Right, we have the completed canon. We have biblical revelation. We have the finished work of Christ. We have 2,000 years of church history testifying to Christ's completed work. Now, although our perception is still somewhat limited because we are finite people, it is still incomparably broader than was John's or any of the Old Testament prophets or any people who lived in that time. We have no reason to doubt God's love. We have no reason to doubt what God has come to do. We have no reason to not understand the implications of the gospel. We live on this side of Calvary. In this way, the least in the kingdom is greater than even John the Baptist. Our, so there's no excuse for the kind of preaching that Jesus is condemning here. Because our capacity for blessedness is infinitely enlarged, not because of health or wealth, or because we are so much more holy today, far from, but because our perception of Christ is that much more full, that much more clear, our relationship with the Father through the Son, that much more pronounced. The chasm set between us and the Father bridged. Those who were far away brought near. We are greater because of Christ. We are greater because of Christ. So beloved, as I close this morning, I ask you, what did you come this morning to see? Engage in a social club? Maybe see a reed blowing in the wind? Tossed about by the winds of politics or public opinion? A well-dressed man in soft clothes? I pray that wasn't it. Sorely disappointed there. If you came for those things, you're in the wrong place. Those who wear soft clothes are in royal palaces. I pray what I actually set before you this morning as a proclaimer of Christ blew any small little notions you might have held about Jesus out of the water. Church, Jesus is a rock. A rock. Not a weed swaying in the wind. He's a rock. We just sung about it. There is eternal life and no other name. And if you profess him, then may you know that Jesus has declared you greater and more infinitely blessed than even John the Baptist. I cannot say that enough because that is saying something. Because John is the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. Just let that sink in. Oh, what men like John, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Elijah, Ezekiel, Moses, and Abraham would have given to know what we know today during their lives, what they would have given how blessed are we? God, help us to never take that for granted. On the other side of the coin, church, here, here's the warning. I have to give this. I'm, I'm giving an invitation right now, and I have to give this to be rounded. Right? That means those who reject this truth have that much more to be condemned by since it has been made fully known. Right? You've heard this morning. You've heard. We are without excuse. So let us come and worship this morning, believing and proclaiming the name of Christ who has revealed his completed work to us. And we are going to sing an appropriate song, The Days of Elijah. As we rise and we sing about these days, once you know this altar is open, I'd be glad to pray with you, share with you more, tell you about this completed work. If you have questions, it be a good time to do that. You can do that where you're at as well. Raise your hand. I'd be glad to come to you. As Nancy has my number printed in the bulletins, send me a text, call, Facebook message, reach out to me. Let's rise and sing. We are in the days of Elijah.
close in prayer together. Father, as we conclude our time together of gathered worship, proclaiming your gospel, proclaiming your glories, we ask that you would refresh us, awaken us to this truth. Father, hide not your special revelation from us, from your children who are gathered here. Help us to see it and appreciate it and never take it for granted. And God, I pray that this morning we have been given by your holy word a confidence boost to go and share the gospel. Father, I pray also that you would put people in our path that we may show the love of Christ to and we may point to your complete and finished work. And Father, we would be remiss if we didn't also say this morning, thank you. Thank you, Father, for in your divine foreknowledge placing us on this side of Calvary. Oh God, we don't deserve it. We don't deserve what you have revealed to us. Thank you, Lord. And for anybody who has not accepted that truth this morning, I pray for your Holy Spirit to come on them and give them eyes to see it, ears to hear it, and hearts to believe it. And we ask it all in the precious name of your Son, Jesus. And if you all please pray with me the Lord's model prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread as we forgive those that's against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I messed up. <laughs> and I did. He threw me off. I'm going to blame it on Jason. We are just men. Our greatness comes in Christ. There's your sermon illustration. God is good. <laughs> and all the time. God is good. Amen. Y'all, uh, don't forget that tonight is the Valentine's Banquet at 6. I, I, I can't overstate. It, it really is a fun time. So I hope you'll come hang out with us. I know that the women have put some really hard work into giving us a, a good evening. It starts at 6. Um, if you're rooting for the Rams, though, you're not welcome. And uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm missing. Uh, next week is conference. Oh, and next Saturday, I forgot to mention this. One quick announcement. Next Saturday, a group of us guys are going to, after we're going to meet here at the church to practice at 10 a.m., and a group of us guys are going to go golfing. If you're a golfer, come hang out with us. Come hang out with us. That's not a gopher. Not, yeah, not gopher. Um, <laughs> it'll be a fun, fun, fun Saturday out fellowshipping. All right. Hey, let's close out with the doxology of Randall. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures in the Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. I love you guys. <laughs> Could I say something? Until this week and walk with Christ. <laughs>